further ado, I will pass this off to Conrad Metcalf, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Building Performance Contractors Association based in Ithaca. Conrad, thank you so much for joining. My pleasure. How's my screen look? Uh, it looks good to me. Okay. Everyone sees the slides? I do, yeah. Very good. So yeah, just to introduce, uh, the Building Performance Contractors Association is a 15-year-old nonprofit trade association whose members are primarily energy efficiency contracting companies. Um, uh, some building science consultants, some Energy Star Raiders. Uh, we are focused on growing the building retrofit marketplace and the businesses of our members through market transformation. So it's a, it's a mouthful. We are also the New York State chapter of the National Efficiency First, which gives us a national footprint and, uh, and highlights a message that we think is very important, which is that uh, you shouldn't be putting solar panels on top of a building that is wasting the energy down underneath. So uh, those are our two organizations and I'll, uh, and I'll move to the second uh, slide. Uh, I put this in here because I just wanted everyone to know that yes, I was once a contractor. Those were the good old days. I was about, this picture was taken about 15 years ago and uh, yeah, I think I'm a lot better looking now than I was then. Uh, our agenda, I think our agenda is important because it highlights the true impact of energy efficiency. Uh, so uh, we want to build up the businesses of our members, obviously, which creates new jobs so that they can hire uh, talented people. We want to reduce energy waste for future generations uh, because right now we're dangerously dependent on fossil fuels. And, and while there are alternatives, we're not ready to address our structural dependency right now. Uh, renewable energy sources are just kind of getting started, really. Uh, and, and we're very happy that the governor has picked up on uh, the process, uh, very progressive vision. Um, we also think that uh, it's very important to reduce energy costs for homeowners and uh, reducing energy dependence on foreign oil and companies that are using our energy dollars to, uh, to, to companies that hate us, or countries that hate us, essentially. So, so uh, we shouldn't waste anything in this day and age, and that's, I guess, why uh, our, I feel our message is so important. So the green marketplace is a rather complex playing field. Uh, one of the things that I try to do uh, repeatedly is to make it less complex for homeowners and for building owners. Uh, but it does cost a little extra to make a building energy efficient. And because we as New Yorkers benefit from that, the state has programs to encourage homeowners and building, uh, building operators. Uh, the city has uh, programs. Uh, there are federal programs, although right now they're not very active at this particular moment, but they they have been in the past. And, uh, and we're moving into a period where the utilities will have much more of a, uh, of a say in programs uh, to incentivize energy efficiency and even renewables. So right now, residential buildings and commercial buildings together use about one third of all energy consumed, uh, two thirds uh, if you count electricity. And so we do expect that the uh, increasing demand for energy is one of the basic driving forces behind the green marketplace. Because energy costs are gonna continue to rise. Uh, right now they're being held down, uh, I think, um, uh, unnaturally by the low cost of uh, natural gas and the, uh, the method that they're taking natural gas out of the earth, uh, fracking, that is uh, relatively inexpensive and that's holding the price of energy down in a number of different fronts. Um, but eventually that cost is gonna rise. Eventually we're gonna start seeing uh, more and more tensions. Uh, whether we have reached peak oil or not is debatable perhaps, but, uh, but we do know one thing, that each barrel of oil 
uh, that we gather um, costs a little more to produce. We have to go deeper. We have to go farther. Right now, tensions in the, uh, in the Arctic are uh, starting to become inflamed because everybody wants a piece of the oil that's underneath the Arctic. So, uh, so oil is going to become more and more expensive. But like I said, right now, it's being uh, held down by the cheap cost of natural gas. But there are uh, more dramatic market forces, and uh, this is on the, the local level here. Most homes are just leaky compared to what they should have. New York has some of the, uh, the oldest housing stock in the country and some of the coldest weather, especially the farther north you go. Uh, so these are homes uh, that are made out of brick and have very little insulation, um, and they breathe. They have uh, a lot of air infiltration. Uh, central air conditioners are not uh, producing the way they were designed to produce and a lot of it is poor installation. And uh, larger buildings have larger issues, also larger benefits, but it's a whole different uh, ball game to address larger buildings. So uh, in smaller buildings we have uh, $12,000 in energy efficiency improvements yields about $2,400 in annual energy savings. So that's a three to five year uh, payback generally. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is pretty standard. These are averages, but it's pretty standard uh, that we can uh, generate that kind of return on investment. Uh, for larger buildings, 30% uh, annual energy savings is not unusual. Uh, this uh, can be done in a variety of ways, and uh, typically the larger the home, the more opportunity for energy savings, but of course the cost is higher as well. So, so we, look at, uh, we look at return on investment with energy efficiency, and, uh, and that's uh, the focus that our contractors have when they go to a house and start looking at it. Um, and really, we might... I might be sitting here saying you as homeowners should go out and make your homes energy efficient, but there's a reason that I don't. And, uh, and our business really starts with uh, high tech diagnostic equipment. And when you're bringing that into a home, you're going to learn things that you couldn't possibly know as homeowners. Uh, we use this device here, the blower door to test the amount of air leakage. Um, and, uh, and even new homes uh, have so many cracks in the way they're built. They're built as quickly as possible. I mean, we all know the old homes can be very inefficient, but new homes built as quickly as possible. All those cracks and leaks around the windows and the doors and the attic uh, add up to, you know, a hole the size of a basketball. And that's what we can quantify with a blower door. And then we take this infrared scanner and we go around and look into the walls and see what's going on, whether it has insulation, how much insulation, whether the insulation has settled. Uh, it takes quite a bit of time to figure out what we're doing. And then there's some uh, elaborate testing that goes along with the heating equipment to try to figure out how it's performing, how, the, how everything is functioning. And then uh, the, uh, the we, we formulate a plan, essentially, on how to make the building more efficient. And this also uh, has uh, the effect of making the building more comfortable, uh, safer, more durable, uh, etc. And so, yeah, it may be possible for you to go out and do make your home more energy efficient without all that fancy equipment. But there's a reason that I wouldn't encourage that. And, and it's really uh, some of the problems that we have seen. Uh, if you take a house with a moisture problem, even a small moisture problem, uh, and you seal that up for energy efficiency purposes, it will become a mold problem. And over time, it, will, uh, it may develop asthma for the kids and other health impacts. Uh, so chronic moisture always results in mold. And if it gets into the wood fibers, you have to replace the wood. There's nothing else. You can't just clean it off like people think. So you don't want to tighten up a home that has a moisture problem. Uh, you also don't want to tackle a very common thing in New York, which is ice dams, 
This is where the water is, uh, the snow turns into water at the edge of the roof, starts to work its way up underneath the, uh, the shingles and can really cause severe um, problems, damage to the roof. Uh, you, you might be able to figure out how to fix it. It's not a, a difficult fix, but if you address it improperly, you could really damage the roof deck permanently. So we think uh, these are good reasons to, uh, to uh, uh, employ a, a, a real uh, certified building contractor. Another common problem, something very serious, carbon monoxide, a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas that kills people every year. Uh, in this picture, you can see the carbon monoxide leaking out of the window. And, and these people are pretty lucky they haven't sealed up those cracks around the windows because even small amounts of carbon monoxide can, uh, can make you sick, uh, can have serious health impacts. So, so these are the reasons that we think it's very important to uh, bring on a certified and accredited uh, building performance contractor. Uh, we want to encourage you to do whatever you can to make your buildings, your homes uh, more energy efficient. But when it's time to do it right and you really want to save 30 to 50% of your energy bill, you should try to find a, an accredited uh, contractor and uh, with certified employees. Uh, the Building Performance Institute provides standards and testing and certification to make sure that your contractors are not going to uh, do energy efficiency work and leave you with a dangerous situation. So that's what we're, uh, I'm a big fan of the Building Performance Institute. And, uh, and the purpose of an energy assessment, or what you might uh, have heard is uh, an energy audit. Um, there's actually several different kinds of energy audits that are out there in the world. Um, they all have slightly different reasons for, uh, for the way they do things but we would propose uh, a comprehensive energy assessment. And that looks at all kinds of different things. We see the building as an integrated uh, system of integrated systems. And so it is complicated. Anything you do to the building is going to have a counter effect. I often uh, refer to it as a beach ball full of sharp objects because there are ways that you can make mistakes. And that's why we want to make sure that our contractors, BPCA contractors, uh, know what they're doing, are certified, accredited, and well-trained. So BPCA as a marketing, uh, as a market transformation organization is all about training contractors and then also educating consumers. So these are the things that we hope you will get out of an energy assessment. I'll just mention one additional thing, which is we hope uh, that any comprehensive energy assessment results in homeowner education. So as you uh, have your home assessed, you will learn uh, about the home and you'll learn about how you're using energy. And uh, we think it's a, a great learning experience on top of uh, a, uh, a really important uh, thing that you can do for your, for your home and for your future and for everyone's future. And so, uh, so the, the focus of uh, tonight, I think, is to look at how the governor's uh, REV program, Reforming the Energy Vision, is, uh, utilizes uh, a lot of different things to, uh, with, a, with a very progressive vision going forward. Uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy resources are very important. Um, but it's a distributed energy network that has been characterized as kind of like a solar panel on every roof and a bank of batteries on every corner. Uh, there's, there's really much more to it. Uh, microgrids and on-site power supplies and smart meters all tied in with the New York State Energy Plan and designed to allow for um, more customer choice and clean energy markets that are driven by private sector uh, funds, private sector companies. And so energy efficiency, we feel, is a critical aspect of reaching the governor's new statewide emission reduction targets. And, uh, and that's what Valerie is going to talk about in just uh, one minute. So I'm going to hand off to Valerie, 
and let her talk about those targets and what they mean in terms of policy and implementation. Great, thank you so much, Conrad. That was terrific, very informative. Uh, and Valerie, do we have you on here? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, we're just doing a little screen sharing. Uh, and I just wanna say that folks are already asking questions, which is terrific. Uh, I'm getting them and we keep asking them and we are going to wait until the end, until uh, Valerie, Steven, and Sneha have completed their presentations and then we'll run through the questions and go back and hear from uh, the appropriate speaker. So, uh, and for those of you who joined late, uh, in order to ask a question, you just go to your chat button, uh, which is in the middle of your screen at the bottom, click on it type a question, or if you're not on Zoom, you can text me 607-222-3678. Uh, so we really want this to be as participatory as possible, even though we have to do it this way so it's not too crazy with everyone talking at once. Um, so anyway, thanks again for participating. And uh, Valerie Strauss, uh, the Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at the Association for Energy Affordability, uh, based in the Albany area. Valerie, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to share your expertise with us. Uh, I know we ha have had been an exciting since Governor Cuomo made his big Earth Day announcement, and really we uh, were hoping that you could kind of talk about the high level um, you know, issues related to that announcement and the white paper and give people an overview of where we're at right now with uh, the state's a new standard for energy efficiency. So thanks again. Great. Thank you, Betta and Conrad. And I'm assuming people can hear me unless I hear otherwise. I'm with the Association for Energy Affordability, which is a nonprofit organization focused on energy efficiency in multifamily buildings with an emphasis on low-income affordable housing. We are a weatherization assistance um, program provider for low-income households. We're also just a general technical services provider for retrofits and new construction, including two passive house standards. And my presentation today, I will review the New York State's proposal for energy efficiency investments. It will be an overview without a great deal of detail given our time constraints, but I'm happy to provide more detail in Q&A, or you can always email me. So, Energy efficiency in New York. New York's been investing in energy efficiency for decades with changes in approach over time. And since the late 1990s, we've had a surcharge on our electric bills called the Systems Benefits Charge, or SBC, which was collected and used for renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. A surcharge still, still funds New York Green Bank, our Clean Energy Fund, which supports programs by NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and also some utility programs. We also have a federally funded weatherization assistance program for low-income households. Between 2003 and 2008, New York adopted more aggressive programs, the Renewable Portfolio Standard for Renewable Energy and what's called EAPS, or the Energy Efficiency Portfolio Standard for Energy Efficiency, also funded through ratepayer surcharges with the utilities playing a, a greater role in implementation. As these programs headed to the end of their authorization, in 2015, Governor Cuomo um, in New York adopted the Clean Energy Standard to replace the RPS so that we could continue our path to adoption of renewable energy to fund our homes and businesses. Um, Valerie, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but um, it's a little hard to hear you. Okay. Is this better? Um, How about if I go like this? Okay. Better? That sounds a little bit better to me. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it would be better to have you like on speaker instead of okay. your earbuds. I'm okay. not sure. We were going back and forth between. Yeah. Let then. me try this because I'm a little bit scared if I. Is that better? I think so. Better. Yeah. yeah. I think that's okay. better. Okay. Thanks. If, um, if people can't hear, send a chat message to Betta and I will try to move to my computer, but I'm a little nervous about doing that. Okay, I think that sounds better, thanks. Okay, I will just hold the, speak, the, the microphone to my mouth. Um, so I apologize for how that looks. 
in any case, um, we, we did replace the RPS with the clean energy standard, but EAPS was coming to an end and we did not have replacement on the efficiency side for that program. We did, however, adopt REP, reforming the energy vision as Conrad described. It's an overarching approach to reforming utility business models, encouraging distributed energy resources like solar storage and efficiency and distribution level system planning to address climate change and to support resilience planning. Under REV, the state envisions increased reliance on innovation and private capital to create scale and investments in clean energy, including efficiency. So while some efficiency efforts continued, since there was no real replacement for the major surcharge funded programs, we declined in this national rankings in energy efficiency. We just simply didn't have the programs and the policies in place to keep moving forward in the aggressive way that we need to, to address climate change and to help with energy affordability. To remedy the situation under pressure from advocates, I might add, Governor Cuomo called for a renewed emphasis on efficiency in January 2018. In a white paper outlining that, as we all know, New Efficiency New York program was released on Earth Day and implementation has begun. So I want to talk a little bit about what that implementation, implementation will look like. The new statewide targets, 185 trillion BTUs saved relative to 2025 forecasts, and importantly, a directive for the utilities to ramp up their efforts to 3% annual savings by 2025. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is, and we are currently just above 1% annual savings. It's also very important for the state to meet its New York, its climate change goals and its emissions reductions. The other um, important, one very important uh, emphasis in the white paper is on a fuel neutral approach to it. And people get a little nervous when they, when they hear that. I think maybe we're, we're backtracking into fossil fuels, uh, but it's actually a very important term because it means that we, the program should be free to address unregulated delivered fuels and take a whole building approach. Um, and that's, that's important because the surcharge programs had to be done where the money that was collected was used for consumers that used those utilities. Um, and if you use natural gas through the pipeline and you have electricity, you could take part in those programs. If in fact you had oil or propane delivered to your home, you could not. And as I'm sure many of you know, that's uh, very common in New York State, primarily upstate, but also downstate where there are buildings that operate on a dual fuel basis on gas and oil. So by taking a fuel neutral approach, you can address the whole building or you can simply make sure that you address the needs of those homes with unregulated delivered fuels. Um, what this also does is means that you can encourage electrification, uh, so heat pumps, for example. Um, now, clearly, if you do that, you're actually going to be increasing electricity demand. Um, but what we have had conversations with the state policymakers about this, and the, the idea is to encourage beneficial electrification and make adjustments in how we account for savings and how we calculate what changes are being made in our energy use patterns so that you don't find yourself saying, we missed our savings target, but in fact you missed it for a good reason because you were increasing efficiency and lowering emissions by converting to heat pumps. So that will be taken into consideration. The actions to implement this new effort are gonna be in various venues. Um, there will be state policies, there will be legislation, there will be utility rate cases, utility programs, and there are gonna be the independent actions that all of us take in our homes, our businesses, and our communities. So Conrad mentioned REV, I mentioned it a little bit as well. The implementation of new efficiency in New York is not a departure from REV, which has been in progress although I would add somewhat slow progress for four years, but it's a restatement of the state's dedication to REV and a layering in, belatedly, in my opinion, explicit attention to efficiency. REV's focus is on reforming utility business models so that utilities can help manage and drive investment in di distributed resources to benefit the grid, consumers, and the environment. 
Rev recognizes that incentives or subsidies cannot drive the necessary transformation over the long term, but that significant private investment will, will be needed as well. Yet early evidence from Rev, and given what we know about the barriers to adoption of energy efficiency, it seems clear to those of us in the field that we still do need to have, I'm sorry, I got a signal, my internet connection was unstable, hopefully it's not, um, that, that we will still need incentives, some subsidies, some programs to help us get to where we need to be. So it's also important to note that I have value energy efficiency as a resource on my slide because energy efficiency helps individuals reduce their utility bill it keeps them healthy and safe and comfortable, but it also provides benefits to society at large. It helps the grid and it helps control emissions. Some of that value isn't necessarily captured and we feel it should be paid for as a resource by the utilities. And that will also vary by location, by time of day as well. So some of the key components that are outlined, outlined in the white paper include continuation of NYSERDA's Clean Energy Fund, which is NYSERDA funded programs, as I mentioned before, paid for by a surcharge on our bills. Also utility managed programs and utility procurement, codes and standards for buildings and appliances, and a lead by example for state buildings, including SUNY. So, that sounded good. We have some aggressive targets. We have a vision for how various sectors can contribute, but there are two fundamental and crucial decisions that have not yet been made. How will this effort be funded and what can and should we expect from the utilities in their near term? The funding mechanism is crucial. Within REV, the concept is to provide an incentive for utilities to do more by allowing them to recover their costs and then some to be rewarded for actually helping all of us invest in energy efficiency. So they can help with some funding, they can help overcome other barriers to investment um, and get rewarded in return. So that their incentive is not for us to use more, but to use less. The goal is to shift the reward from investing in capital intensive transmission and distribution infrastructure, and that includes electric, electricity and natural gas, to investing in helping homes and businesses become more efficient and reduce their carbon footprint. There are a few different ways to accomplish that goal. Some are mentioned in the white paper. That's a little bit of getting into the weeds, which I, I won't do in great detail. Um, you he will hear terms and see terms like pay for performance or shared savings or earnings adjustment mechanisms, all of which are a way to incentivize the private market by getting the utility to be a partner with, with their, their customers. There are a number of pilots and new approaches that are being tried and that are discussed in the white paper, but of course all of those take time to come to fruition and to scale. So in the meantime, we believe there needs to be continuation of the programs that have helped us get to where we are today. Um, and we were in a pretty, uh, pretty high up in the rankings um, just a few years ago in our investments in energy efficiency and our achievements. The venues for these decisions, um, there's several different places. So importantly, the Public Service Commission of New York State will have jurisdiction over quite a bit of it. They oversee the budgets for NYSERDA and the New York Green Bank within NYSERDA, and they also regulate the investor-owned utilities. The utility rate cases themselves will be a venue for making some of these decisions, and legislation will be needed for codes and standards and quite possibly for some other developments that we would like to see. The voices of the concerned public are important in all venues. And I know Sneha will, will speak to how you can get engaged in that. Um, rate cases are notoriously difficult to follow, but, but critical. Before I close, I'd like to point out one more notable statement in the white paper, which is that at least 20% of new funding and the funding, remember, is the critical missing piece that we need to address, 20% will be spent on efficiency for low and moderate income households. We at AEA believe that 20% is a bare minimum. We think it should be higher and more proportionate with the, the percentage of the population that actually falls within those definitions in New York State. And most importantly, that's the population most severely impacted by energy costs and poor quality housing. 
Energy efficiency in housing not only addresses energy costs, but also health, safety, and comfort, as Conrad pointed out, asthma, allergy prevention, and, um, and you know, carbon monoxide poisoning. Furthermore, the energy burden, the cost and hardship of paying your utility bills is inseparable from the housing burden or housing affordability, whichever term you prefer. And I know most of us are aware that in many parts of New York, particularly downstate, housing costs are also, um, also a burden. The cost of housing includes your utility bills if you don't pay them directly. So either way, you're paying. Um, efficiency in affordable multifamily buildings is therefore critical, even when the owner pays for heat or hot water. So I just have this, um, this chart here that I just put up to illustrate the impact of affordability and energy burden. 6% um, energy burden is, is considered the limit of what should be acceptable. Um, clearly, we have upstate, downstate divide, urban, rural, different fuel use patterns, et cetera. Um, some communities face disproportionate environmental impacts from our energy choices and because of racial and economic disparities and disenfranchisement. So this is something else that AEA is very concerned about and that we did see addressed to some extent in the white paper and we hope to see addressed more fully. And we'll hear more about environmental justice from our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks so much, Valerie. It was very informative. Uh, and a couple of people joined uh, while you were speaking. So I just wanna welcome the newcomers and also let you know that you can submit questions via chat, uh, which is on the button in the middle. And uh, there was a question about why can't I see other people's chat? Um, don't worry, I can see the chat and our co-hosts, our speakers can, and that way it's not a distraction with a running dialogue um, during the presentations. And then at the end, we'll have an opportunity to uh, have the presenters answer the relevant questions. So that's how that works. Um, next up, as Valerie said, we have Stephen Roundtree. Uh, Stephen is the Environmental Policy and Advocacy Coordinator for We Act for Environmental Justice based in Harlem. And Stephen is going to be talking about uh, the important environmental justice implications for energy efficiency. Uh, Stephen? Sure. Uh, can you all hear me? All right, everyone yeah. who I can see can hear me, so that's great. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks um, for joining us, and thanks for having me on, um, Ben and others, and thank you for our, the previous speakers for teeing this up, Valerie. Uh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Stephen Roundtree. Uh, as Betta said, Environmental Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at WE Act for Environmental Justice, uh, joining you now from the WE Act office in Harlem. Uh, so WE Act, along with the folks we've already heard from, are engaged in advocacy around the governor's new efficiency initiative. And we work generally uh, at WE Act across several different environmental justice issues to help foster thriving communities. Uh, I wanted to continue our conversation by sharing a little more about why energy efficiency is an environmental justice issue uh, and how the issue affects communities in northern Manhattan and all across the state. Uh, they wanted to briefly share the work we actually done in this space and is continuing to do. Uh, so first of all, what, what is environmental justice? I, I like to define terms before we start getting into it. Um, environmental justice is, is a term that people hear often uh, and more often, and, and that's good, uh, but people don't always understand what it really means. So environmental justice is the equal allocation of environmental benefits and environmental burdens, uh, particularly among people of different races or social classes. So in other words, it's, it really means fair access to a clean and healthy environment for everyone. Fairly simple. Um, so that's the what of environmental justice. Uh, there's also the how, and the how is also very important. Um, so, so that is, you know, along with having equal allocation of benefits and burdens, there's also, you know, equal ability to participate in decision making around these issues. Um, so yeah, so so not just not just what's happening, that everyone's being treated fairly, but everyone is, is contributing to how, how the decisions are made. So that, that's sort of the, the, the premise that we're working. Uh, under one when I talk about environmental justice. Um, so energy efficiency and, uh, and energy efficiency policy are really critical, critically important to advancing environmental justice in New York. Uh, there's a few key reasons, uh, and they've already been sort of discussed by Valerie a bit, uh, but one is that energy efficiency is highly intersectional with housing quality and indoor environmental health. Um, also, that energy efficiency has broad implications on climate change and resilience to climate change. Um, sort of undergirding uh, both of those those topics are, are, is the, the idea that Energy affordability 
uh, particularly for folks who rent uh, and also folks who own their own homes, is, is a you know is a critical connective tissue. So I want to examine this more closely. Um, so when we talk about people, um, talk about people who take home a low or moderate income in New York, um, those folks are disproportionately people of color, um, and they disproportionately live in housing that is substandard in terms of sufficiency and, and you know overall weatherization. Uh, whether it's a pre-war tenement building in New York City, like that we're familiar with here at WEACT um, in Northern Manhattan, uh, or a small older two to four family building in a, in a Rust Belt type city upstate, uh, or a single family residence in, in a rural area. Uh, overall, these households make up about 40% of all New Yorkers, uh, and as Valerie mentioned too, they constitute roughly 30% of all electric load. Um, so the governor's plan is calling for something like a 20% you know, carve out uh, for efficiency programming for affordable multifamily houses uh, or housing. Um, so while that's a start and, and it's far from nothing, uh, it's not adequately serving the needs of older and young people. Uh, and, and that's an environmental justice issue, as I'll explain. So, you know, as a part of this, as a part of the, the idea that, like, you know, who are we serving these services? We're talking about who, you know, who is able to, um, afford electricity. So folks who take home a low income uh, pay a disproportionately high percentage of their income towards their housing and towards their energy costs as well. Um, as Valerie again noted, um, whether you pay a separate electric bill or don't, um, you're, you pay for your electricity. It's, it's in the cost of your housing. Uh, this is sort of the baseline. Uh, if, we, if we combine this proportionate board, uh, burden with the state's initiative funding, say like 10 to 18% below what you know, the proportional level is to serve LMI communities is sort of compounding and exacerbating the affordability problem that already exists in part because the, you know, available funds are, are going to other sectors of the building stock and of the economy, they're already experiencing greater benefits. So it's not really leveling the playing field um, necessarily. It, it's, it's kind of in a, in some ways can further tilt it. So that's kind of um, the hope of, of, you know, when we're advocating, when we're advocating and through, you know, we acts lens, we're sort of hoping to, to address issues like that. Uh, again, 20% um, is, is, is far from nothing, and, and it's a great start, but we're, we're really hoping to, to see that come back into proportion with folks who live in that housing stock. Um, so, and, and we act, we're also prioritizing the impacts of, uh, you know, changing climate, the impacts that changing climate has on people's ability to live and thrive in their homes. Uh, we know that among other things, climate change is gonna bring uh, more severe and frequent summer heat to the state. Uh, in New York City, that's particularly bad because the city's hot anyway. Uh, on account of the way the built environment stores heat. So people who are already living in buildings that are less weather tight um, and facing a greater energy burden to cool their homes with AC have to now double down on that burden as they need to cool their homes uh, more and more. In addition, poorly weatherized older buildings in New York City and across the state are more susceptible to dampness, which exacerbates their environmental health problems like respiratory disease caused by mold. So we know in New York, um, we're expecting over the next 40 to 50 years, my understanding is we're expecting a, roughly a 15% uptake in precipitation that's just gonna lead to more dampness. So it's like more asthma, also like more mold and pests that, that also cause asthma or exacerbate asthma. So again, that, that's all to say, you know, that, you know, underserved communities, you know, being, being underserved is really a recipe for, for not good things. Um, not only for the environmental justice communities themselves, but also for the state as a whole. If we're talking about our climate goals, uh, we're basically working under the premise that we're trying to, you know, ameliorate climate problems in proportionally to how we're sort of, how we're contributing to them. Um, and, and again, a disproportionate, sort of disproportionate allocation of funding um, for low to moderate income means that those, those housing, you know, that housing stock is not going to be fully participating in, you know, clean energy solution. Uh, for the state. And so, you know, that's, that's also a problem. If we're not, if we're, you know, if we're going to be succeeding together, we're succeeding together. We can't, we can't really um, succeed if, if only some of the, the building stock is really being served. Um, at least that, that, that's our take. So, and, and then, and then to complete the circle there and failing to meet climate goals, you know, having, having climate change that, you know, is sort of spiraling out of control um, and, and not doing enough to meet the goals that we've set out really impacts people of color and people of low to moderate income first and worst for reasons I mentioned before. So they live in, they live in cities where, where heat is more of an issue and they you know, disproportionately live in substandard housing. So it's kind of a cyclical issue that, that really starts with how, how folks are being served um, by the programming that we all sort of uh, you know, agree to enact as a state, as, as a group of governed folks. 
Um, so that's our challenge here, and and uh, and looking at things through through the lens of uh, of environmental justice, and so through the lens of racial equity uh, and, and energy micro equity is how we sort of approach seeking policy solutions. Uh, that's so that's a good transition. It's a um, good transition to what we act is sort of doing here at home. And uh, before we get to Sneha's piece on, on on sort of our next steps collectively as as advocates at the state, I wanted to mention. Um, what what we act has done in our community from a from a sort of grassroots level to combat the problem. Um, so we act is working with our partners at Solar One, Sustainable CUNY, and the Urban Home Stairs Assistance Board. You have uh, to help connect residents uh, of affordable multifamily buildings with energy affordability solutions related to climate, housing, efficiency. Uh, the project focused uh, initially on aggregating buyers of rooftop solar among HDFC. So that's Housing Development Fund Corporation (HDFC), uh, low-income co-op housing. I mean, we've been working for about nine months um, to meet our kilowatt goal of 150 kilowatts of solar PV on top of these houses. We've met that. Um, we're in the process of exceeding that goal um, by a fair distance. We're up, up over 300 uh, kilowatts, so we're excited about that with nine buildings in the pipeline. Um, it's approaching 1,000 people being served, um, you know, uh, realizing lower bills. So we're excited about that as, like, as a first run. Uh, as the project has expanded, as prices of solar, uh, you know, have gone down, um, we're receiving more interest from the portfolio of buildings. We're expanding the program um, to a more comprehensive efficiency, renewables, and popular education initiative. We act as partnering with buildings in northern Manhattan that are looking to reduce their costs, and we're connecting them to efficiency resources that may have otherwise not, um, they, they might not have availed themselves of, including retrofit accelerator, which is the city's, um, the city of New York's one-stop shop for energy auditing and services. Uh, the city's cool roofs program as well as through our community chosen solar installer who's evaluating solar potential as well as offering low pricing um it's like 75 percent below average kilowatt rates so based on what we negotiated so we're really jazzed about that um along with free and reduced cost efficiency goods and services from the city um, state and utility um that's con ed in new york city so we act as also offering free workshops uh, on apartment and building scale energy efficiency for cooperators and renters to learn more about how to use less energy themselves, and also how to better uh, advocate for sound energy efficiency policy at the state and city level. Um, we're very excited about connecting people with these resources and fostering a healthier and more empowered Northern Manhattan community. Um, we act is also working on microgrid planning and other resiliency infrastructure. Um, if you, you know, want to know more about that, what we're up to, please contact me offline. Or if you have any questions, I'm here for it. But that, that is, is where I'll leave you. I'm excited to, to hand it over to to say how to talk about next. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, really good to get your perspective and uh, hear the kind of high level um, critical um, piece on environmental justice and then also the awesome on the ground work that you all are doing uh, in Harlem. So thanks for sharing. And uh, Sneha Ayagari will be next. Uh, Sneha is a Schneider Fellow uh, for the Eastern Region uh, Climate and Energy Program for the NRDC. Um, so Sneha, uh, we're gonna ha get her up here and also share her screen. And Sneha is going to be uh, talking about how we can take action and be more involved in this movement to accelerate energy efficiency adoption in New York State. Uh, and as I said uh, before, please submit questions via chat uh, at the end uh, after Sneha's presentation, then we'll have an opportunity to go back and hear from individual speakers um, and, and get answers to your questions. So please share that. And I'll also be uh, sending a follow-up email with everyone's PowerPoints and can also share uh, relevant links for, for Steven to learn more about what we act's doing. Great, thank you so much, Betta. So it's great to be here and thank you all for joining. Um, I'll be going over a few high level ways to stay engaged and get involved. And also touching on a few points that some of the other speakers have made earlier. And as Betta mentioned, the slides will be available towards the end as well. So. I provided some links within the slides, which may be helpful um, going forward. And as Betta mentioned, I work in the Eastern 
team of the Climate and Clean Energy Program at the NRDC. Uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council is an international environmental nonprofit organization with uh, several million members and more than 100,000 in New York State. We work on a number of issues, including energy efficiency and renewable energy. So some of the next steps would be to let your elected officials and utility companies know that energy efficiency is an important issue to you. Uh, whether you're a building owner, whether you're a renter, uh, everybody has a stake in this process and everybody has a big impact to make by participating. Uh, the second point is to pursue energy efficiency in your building to the extent possible using some of the strategies and context that Conrad provided, um, as well as Valerie and Stephen. The third, of course, is to educate your friends, families, and colleagues. And then the fourth is to stay engaged in the process, in the regulatory process. And I'll go a little bit more into depth into what are some ways to do that. So the first point to ask your utility about energy efficiency programs, I know it's sometimes a little difficult to keep track of what each of the different utilities are doing and where their programs are. So once we send out the slides, we'll have this link as well. But NYSERDA actually has one portal that has a list of each of the different utilities. So based on where you're based in the state, you can click and look at the different classes of housing, whether residential or commercial, multifamily, and see what's available in terms of rebates, in terms of educational resources. And, from, and it'll also have contact information of how to get more involved and reach out to your utility to see what's offered and also what are some gaps that you would like to see fixed as well. So that's a way that you can engage directly with your utility and with NYSERDA as well. So to provide a little bit of context, and I know the other speakers have talked about why it's so important to have energy efficiency to meet our environmental goals, I just wanted to quickly highlight the role of the utility and how that connects to the energy efficiency company and you as the consumer. So utilities serve as providers uh, and kind of as a middle between energy efficiency companies and provide benefits to the consumer. And it's really important to continue to engage our utilities. And as Valerie touched upon, uh, the Public Service Commission is very involved in regulating utilities and what they provide in terms of energy efficiency services. Some examples of energy efficiency programs uh, which both Valerie and Conrad touched upon are some are more traditional what we think about in terms of lighting, for example, and shifting to more energy efficiency light, energy efficient lighting, which will reduce energy costs and also reduce emissions um, and electricity use. And there's also programs that are catered towards particular types of housing, for example, affordable multifamily housing uh, that Valerie mentioned, and then newer pr programs that are being designed to be able to incentivize energy efficiency and market transformation. So there's several resources out there. Um, this is more provided as for you to go back and look at later, but there's several environmental organizations, advocates, contractors, people in the field that have written many different articles and you can understand energy efficiency both from a practical sense of how to implement it also from a policy standard and in learning more and having more questions it'll be easier to engage in these issues as well moving forward and as mentioned earlier um, in Valerie's presentation uh, without energy efficiency we won't be able to meet several of our climate goals. So when you're engaging with utility companies or engaging in public comments or things like that, these are some points to keep in mind um, as climate activists and um, people who care about clean energy. And in order to reduce our carbon emissions to have it 50% renewable energy by 2030, uh, we'll need to continue the momentum that's built upon this announcement and make sure that we follow through and really achieve those savings and become a leader again in energy efficiency. And in addition to the climate goals, um, as Stephen mentioned, there's many public health and also economic implications of energy efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency creates a lot more clean energy jobs 
um, than many other energy related sectors as well. And these are all points to keep in mind when engaging with elected officials or engaging with others who are invested in energy efficiency. So the third mechanism is to submit public comments to the PSC. And perhaps several of you have done this before, but for those who are newcomers, uh, you can go to the Department of Public Service website and looking through the slides, it has a walkthrough of where are the different links that you need to go to. Uh, basically, you can go to their website and pull up the docket where all of the comments that were filed either by organizations, by utilities, by the state itself, uh, will all be there documented. And you can also register as a party or you could submit a public comment, uh, which is available to everybody. So once you go to that website, then you can find a tab that says click on public comments and use that to post your own comment. It'll bring up a form and you can submit what you want to say about the white paper that Valerie mentioned or about energy efficiency more broadly. And this is one deadline that's coming up is on uh, July 16th. And so you can submit your comments before that and it'll be read, but there'll be more deadlines coming up and more opportunities over the next few months and several years to engage in this process. And for those of you who maybe might be new to writing comments, these are some high level suggestions. Uh, something that's helpful to do is always to be specific in recommendations and comments to the extent that's possible. Who are you? Why are you writing this? And how does it matter? And what are some specific recommendations based on your perspective? It's also helpful to build off of documents filed in the record. And as I showed in one of the earlier screens, when you go there, it has a database of basically everything that's been filed. So it can be helpful to go through and read through those and see what you can do to build off of what's already there. And um, it's always, of course, important to submit in a respectful tone. Um, for don'ts, uh, it's important to make sure that you fill in all of the various aspects to be as complete and thorough as possible so it'll be read and will have the maximum impact. And it's always important to do research and ask any clarifying questions you may have, both through looking through the record and, of course, everyone on this call and um, online also is happy to be resources. Um, and then the fourth um, is a bit of a recap of some of the strategies I already mentioned, asking your utility about energy efficiency programs, to learn more about energy efficiency, to submit public comments. And then the fourth aspect is there'll be a series of upcoming regional meetings and focus groups um, that were highlighted by at the technical conferences. The details for where those will be and when haven't been released yet by the um, by NYSERDA or by the Department of Public Service, but they'll be posted on that website. And for folks who are on this listserv or on others, um, they'll also be shared. Um, another way to stay involved is every two weeks, there are calls from different clean energy advocates. And if you have interest in that, that I can also send you the call-in information and kind of join the ongoing discussion. Um, and as part of asking your utility about energy efficiency programs and getting involved, Valerie mentioned rate cases. So that's another way that you can follow um, using a kind of similar process on their website um, and follow and see what's going on in your utility and how you can stay involved. And with that, uh, I'll open up to questions and turn it back to Feta. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Sneha. Uh, covered a lot of ground there. And uh, for people who are unfamiliar with submitting comments, um, it was great to have the walkthrough, but probably still a little daunting. So if you are really interested, um, you know, and it would be great if we can get more comments in, um, we can help, we can provide some sample comments to people, uh, highlighting some different issues that are important, uh, if that's helpful to people. So, and also as Sneha said, um, we do have uh, energy efficiency listserv and calls every two weeks. And it's part of a coalition that came together in the lead up to Earth Day to put pressure on Governor Cuomo and, uh, and we're continuing with that coalition. So if your organization is interested in endorsing it or you just wanna be on that listserv, 
um, definitely let me know and I'll include that in the follow-up. Um, so great. Uh, I'm happy that we have managed to retain 35 people. Uh, great group tonight, uh, despite it being a beautiful summer evening. Uh, I'm delighted that so many people are, are interested in, in learning about this important topic uh, and meeting our climate and clean energy goals through ener energy efficiency. So I want to make sure uh, that we get to people's questions. Um, we had a few in the beginning uh, during Conrad's presentation. Oh, and I'm going to, I think I might have muted Conrad. So let me make sure to unmute him. Yeah, thank you for muting me. <laughs> well, you were kind of popping up um, sporadically yeah, on my screen. So I wanted to... to fix that. Okay. Um, so we had a couple of questions for you in the beginning. Um, one was uh, a question about the $12,000 improvement in energy efficiency and, and saying that it's, it's not possible um, that $12,000 would um, yield a $12,000 improvement in energy efficiency would yield $2,400 yearly savings um, on her house, um, to her total yearly utility bill is less than $700. Uh, I've done some measures already. So Obviously. Conrad, what do you think? <laughs> yes. uh, you know, every home is totally unique. Uh, we often say that every home is a science experiment because uh, every home has its own thing going on. So yes, uh, for that particular home, no need to invest $12,000 in that home. But if you have a brick home in Watertown with no insulation, $12,000 will probably yield more than that in savings. So, uh, so that was an average. That, uh, so it's rel I mean, it's all relative. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. And, and I'm sure if people want, they can, you know, follow up with you more for details on that. But that's, again, why it's so important to consult with a professional contractor and who can assess your individual needs. Right. Um, speaking of which, the next, next question is, where can I find accredited contractors? Mm -hmm. So I would direct you to uh, bpi.org as a website. Uh, you can also go to our website, BPCA website, is home-performance.org, but bpi.org is easier to remember. Great. And I can also provide that link when I, I send that around. Um, and most people are eligible for a free home energy audit. So mm -hmm. if you haven't done one, it's worth pursuing. Um, okay, can you address how your association's members work on large buildings in urban areas and the particular challenges presented in retrofits for buildings in urban settings? Yes, I can do that. Um, first, I want to plug in my computer so it doesn't turn off. Uh, so yeah, in uh, larger buildings, it's not so much an energy audit as what we call benchmarking. So benchmarking is looking at uh, data primarily, and it's a way of comparing your building to other buildings of similar size and use type. So uh, for larger buildings, we address those uh, buildings through benchmarking, although the actual measures, the things that we do to that building to make it energy efficient are often very similar. They're often air sealing, uh, they're often uh, in a large building. Um, in, in a residential building, if you ask me what is the most important thing to do, I would say seal the floor of the attic because pressure from uh, heat as it's rising uh, creates pressure uh, in the ceiling just below the floor of the attic. And uh, that pressure uh, forces hot air out of the cracks that might exist there. And that pulls an equal amount of cold air in from somewhere in the house, usually the basement or such. Uh, in a larger building, we might look at the elevator shafts. We might look at the ventilation systems. The, uh, the larger building has more pressure because it's, it's taller. So there's more hot air rising. So at the top of that building, there's much more pressure. And uh, so that's how we would address that. We would start with benchmarking comparing it to other buildings of similar size and type 
and especially looking at buildings that have had energy efficiency measures and comparing your building to, or a building to those buildings. Great, um, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if this question is directed to you, Conrad, or it might be to Valerie, um, which is what are, I think it's maybe to Valerie, what are micro turbines? I, did you talk about micro turbines? I, I didn't. I, um, and Conrad may know more about it than I do. Um, there are my, my point of reference for micro turbines are like mini CHP. Um, units, which um, are combined heat and power micro turbines for the residential, those generally run on natural gas. Uh, but maybe Conrad has a different idea. Uh, I think I referred to um, micro, not micro turbines. Micro grid? Yeah, micro grid. That's, that's different. Yeah, yeah, that's different. So, uh, now, there are micro turbines. Those are the ones that uh, you throw them off the back of your sailboat to generate uh, <laughs> electricity for your sailboat. That would be con called a micro turbine. But, um, but a micro grid is actually kind of a mini self-contained grid, and uh, it usually has its own power supply. It usually has its own storage system. Uh, there aren't very many of them out there. They're piloting you know, micro well, Yeah, I, I would say, um, I mean, I sort of does have a whole program to try to uh, support microgrids as an example of how to build resiliency into communities. So there's right. been a competitive process and there are microgrids. Most of the, the microgrids that have sort of shown, proven their worth have been, for example, at universities. Um, I believe NYU had one that continued to power during the blackout in New York City. Uh, but the goal for those of us who are climate change activists is to have microgrids powered by renewable energy coupled with storage um, versus the, the fossil fuel versions that we have now. Um, yeah. But even the fossil fuel versions have a, have a role to play. Um, so Great. yeah, I think that, that was probably the question. And I, actually, someone clarified that uh, the micro turbine was on the slide okay. of the distributed energy resources mm. um, that I think Conrad had when he referenced the rev. So, but important to also touch on uh, microgrids as well uh, in this energy space that we're in. So, hopefully, that clarified things on the micro turbine uh, front. Um, the, another question is, I'm not sure who this was. Oh, for Conrad. Thank you um, for specifying this. Can you, Conrad, can you talk about non-energy benefits of energy efficiency improvements? Sure. The non-energy benefits typically are, uh, well, actually, we used to talk about non-energy benefits as being comfort, durability, uh, and health. Those were the primary non-energy benefits. Now we've kind of got a larger sense for what that means. And so now uh, we're looking at social benefits of, uh, of energy efficiency. And so, that, so it wouldn't be a direct energy benefit, but um, reduced carbon uh, emissions is a social benefit of energy efficiency. It's a non-energy benefit. So there's a whole variety of uh, non-energy benefits that uh, – that include uh, reduction in emissions, uh, cost control for fuels, um, environmental uh, reasons that we would uh, we, we benefit from energy efficiency. Really, what we're trying to talk about is not creating new power plants, not creating new fossil fuel venues for energy, uh, and using energy efficiency as a resource. Uh, what we often call a megawatt, which is a megawatt that was never that never had to be created because we have energy efficiency. <laughs> um, okay, here but, here for um, megawatts. Betta, I received a I think what was might have been a private question or a clarification through the chat, and that was I had a term an acronym used there called that said FPL, and someone wanted a definition. That's the federal poverty level. Thank you. Yes, it's important for uh, a reminder to not um, use 
all of the um, acronyms that people always are using and we just forget because we're used to it. Even PSC, um, Public Service Commission, um, or DPS, Department of Public Service, um, we can't expect that everybody's going to be in the loop um, with all the jargon. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, and let's see, okay, we have a clarification uh, from someone about the comments. So Sneha, um, you could take this one. Um, the comments that are due on July 16th, which is next Monday that you know we're encouraging people to submit. Um, this person is saying that they are to be submitted directly to NYSERDA via email to new efficiency ny at nyserta.ny.gov, not the formal comment process on the PSC website. Um, or Sneha, Valerie. Um, mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Is, I, is that correct? I say that's, that is correct. Um, the, there are two, sort of two different ways that they take comments. Uh, one is that there's a rule requiring them to publish in the state register a notice saying we might take an action on this and they're required to take official and unofficial comments and they have to give you 60 days. That's not what's happening right now. There will be that later. Um, so this is an informal input to NYSERDA and DPS, but, but being sent to NYSERDA. Um, so you're correct about that address and that is where we are supposed to file our comments. That doesn't mean you can't also file in the docket as Sneha had shown on her, on, her, um, on her slides because those will also get looked at. Um, so I don't know if Sneha wants to add to that, but um, Two sides I think the same. you could do either. I think you can do either or both. Um, thanks for the clarification. Put that in the notes as well. Um, one benefit of putting it on as a public comment is it'll be available to others as well to see and later to build upon. So um, that's helpful, but we'll also put the email address as well. Okay, great. Well, good to know there are multiple ways to submit comments and uh, we will definitely share that email address as well as the slides that were very helpful um, about the you know, step-by-step -step process of submitting comments, which for folks who are interested in continuing to engage on these energy is issues, that is a very important process to participate in. Um, so, okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have another question um, for Valerie. Can you talk about pay for performance and how that will change the cost-effective guidelines used by NYSERDA for calculating return on investment for <laughs> energy efficiency improvements. Okay, I can give it a try. <laughs> uh, I, a complicated topic, which I'd be happy to discuss more offline too. Um, I think it, there's a, a lot of to be determined there, but just to, to really sort of briefly and probably in, incompletely explain what pay for performance is referring to. Uh, it, often the way energy efficiency programs have been run is that there's an incentive provided um, either to the contractor or directly to the customer to engage, to, to do install measures, um, our new appliances and, um, and there's an expected savings, an expected return. Uh, what pay for performance is, is supposed to do, the way that they're envisioning their pilot, their various versions of it, is for a, an aggregator, a third party provider, would take the risk of ensuring that, that the efficiency savings are real. They would find customers um, who really, you know, the financial arrangements could, could, could be vary. Um, but NYSERDA or the state or the utility, whoever is funding it, in this case, it's a NYSERDA pilot um, project. NYSERDA would pay that entity only when they see the actual savings delivered um, from whatever they're doing. So they're paid for performance, for real savings that, that show up at the meter, for example. And the relationship between that party who's getting paid and the customers is a separate contractual issue between the two of them. So for example, if you're a homeowner and you know, Conrad comes in and, and his contractors do work and you pay for it, you get a return over time because over time you save money on each bill. Um, 
but you have to wait for your return. A third party provider could say, I'll pay for all of that. Um, and then I'll get my money from NYSERDA over time and help you, help you not have to um, invest that money. So there are different financial arrangements. And um, there are a lot of tricky details to work out. There's a lot of skepticism in some parts that what will happen is what we call cream, cream skimming, where only the easiest, cheapest uh, work is done rather than uh, the, the more longer lasting um, foundational investment that you probably should be making in your building. So um, how that ends up being paid for and return on investment a lot depends and uh, the pilot isn't in place yet. So I think those questions are all still being asked and I'm not sure that they've been answered yet. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Valerie. Um, thanks for taking a crack at it. Great question. And uh, I think that also falls under the TBD category as well. I know it's uh, a lot that uh, is still being worked out how this is going to be financed and incentivized. Um, and speaking of which, I don't know, um, Stephen, whether you want to say anything more about uh, the on-bill financing that I, I know the environmental justice, climate justice, um, energy efficiency coalition has been advocating for. Um, but just, you know, while we're on the subject of sort of creative financing. Stephen is muted. Oh, really? Oops, sorry. My bad. Oh, okay. Wait, there you are. No, I think he muted himself and then you muted him. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Yeah, we were both doing it. Sorry. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so I, I don't have a ton more to say in that, uh, I, but I can tell you that, you know, there are traditionally barriers to folks who, um, you know, have worse credit or have, you know, don't have access to, access to capital when they're looking to do these improvements. So when folks are looking for ways to finance energy, uh, energy efficiency retrofits, like, uh, you know, an alternative way of doing that is something like, A, like looking at, you know, an alternative to traditional, um, traditional um, credit worthiness, like a FICO score, uh, and also just like ways to, you know, do financing without access and capital like something like pay as you save um is like a is a process you know by which you just have the payments you make on your electric bill um count back towards the the, the upgrades that you've you've purchased so the it's just a, a, you know one of, of several ways to do sort of creative financing for folks who who have barriers to doing it like um the the sort of low-hanging fruit folks who can just like put up on front to, to do the work um, this is Valerie. Can I just, I just add to that? Um, that's right. So you could pay, for, individual consumer could pay for upgrades to their property through on bill financing. One thing that um, Stephen and NRDC and AEA have been working together as part of the Energy Efficiency for All Coalition uh, with several other organizations is, is looking at large multifamily buildings uh, with renters, uh, trying to work with uh, mortgage lenders and, uh, and some of the policymakers in the state on helping them, on helping mortgage lenders to understand how to underwrite to savings, which means that they can, if you're um, refinancing an affordable housing project, you could get a larger uh, loan than you would otherwise and use it to do upgrades to the building because the lender is, is assured and is convinced that that you'll be able to pay the larger loan back because you're going to be saving money on your energy bills. So that's another creative financing tool that we're working on and that we think the New York Green Bank could be very helpful with. Uh, thanks, Valerie. Um, another question related to financial incentives. Um, are there incentives for landlords to make energy efficiency improvements? So maybe you covered that. Um, well, I, there are, um, but insufficient and program designs could be better. So that's something that we have been working on. There are, there has historically been some. Um, one of the other issues that we're faced with uh, in some jurisdictions, and it's a big issue in New York City, is that uh, if you're talking about affordable housing, you don't want landlords to necessarily, but it's because they're mandated to or because they choose to, 
do major energy efficiency improvements that cost a lot of money and go into the rent board and claim, it's called a, a major capital improvement, claim that because they spent so much money, they should be allowed to raise their rents and therefore you have unaffordable housing. So that is also an issue we're working on. Yeah, very important to consider, uh, especially given the affordability crisis um, in many parts of the state. Uh, so we have a different um, topic coming in here. Uh, how important is it to replace heating our homes with gas or oil with efficient heat pumps to meet New York's goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 40% by 2030? Um, probably any of you could field this, but who wants to take it? Sounds like it was a, a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have a ringer in the audience. So I think it's very important. Uh, I think uh, we have a lot of new technologies that we need to implement and, uh, and heat pumps uh, is one of the more significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. I think it's, it, it, we need an all, all, all hands on deck strategy for climate change. And I think that's, that's definitely an important one. Um, and we have to match it with moving our wholesale uh, energy system to renewables because you don't want those heat pumps um, to have require more natural gas and our coal infrastructure to produce that electricity. Certainly don't. Uh, Sneha um, or Stephen, do you have anything to add on the heat pump front? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to mention the same thing about, you know, beneficial electrification being beneficial, um, but also, you know, requiring that we're not using electricity that's, you know, still being made from from peaker power plants, because that's sort of the, that's sort of what will result from a half measure for, you know, achieving, you know, getting into getting into heat pumps, but not, not green. And I think in addition to the points that have already been said, uh, I think utilities play have a big role to play in addition to nice data. There's already a few uh, incentives that are out there, but at, at the current time, there's still a lot more to be done in order to kind of realize the full potential of heat pumps. Um, but that being said, it's important to make sure that they're powered by clean and renewable energy as well. Well, on that note, uh, <laughs> I think we can close out because we don't have any other questions. Um, and I just want to, oh, wait, we do one more question. And, and it is only 25. So uh, I love this audience. Um, great questions. Don't want to shut it down yet. Um, okay. Are there any incentives or programs in New York's REV addressing lead, asbestos, or other environmental concerns in housing? Hmm. I, 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 within Rev, I not explicitly. Um, and one of the things, so obviously the weatherization program does a little bit, but not a lot. Um, and there are other housing programs, but but not much. And uh, I think this is where you'll see if you look at the comments that come in on July 16th. I do believe that you will see a number of them suggesting that there be um, at least one set of comments, but probably more, suggesting that we need more interagency collaboration in the state to achieve our, our energy and housing goals. And, um, and so that's where you need the housing agencies to play a role, which they have not to date. Uh, I will say that most of the contractors that are accredited by the Building Performance Institute are uh, trained educated to look for uh, lead, asbestos, other environmental concerns in, uh, in the process of a comprehensive energy assessment. Uh, yeah, we also have someone saying that there are, it's, there's some health and safety money under home performance. Hmm, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's, there's not a lot out there and sometimes it becomes a barrier if you find um, safety problems and you can't actually work on the house. So it can be a problem. Uh, there's also some initiatives on um, healthy homes initiatives looking at how to, um, it's complicated, but how to get Medicaid involved in doing 
work within homes um, on, on health and safety to prevent hospitalizations and, um, and doctor bills. And so there is it's Green and Healthy Homes Initiative and, uh, and I sort of also looking into working with Department of Health on that. But again, pilots. Yeah, we're, we're happy to listen, Hugo. You have any ideas on <laughs> Now we can pull health and safety money out of home performance. Give me a call. Okay, last question. Um, New York State has a lot of existing buildings, so efficiency uh, retrofits are an essential part of the solution to greenhouse gas emissions. But we also need very strict efficiency standards and building codes for all new buildings. What level of government is most likely to respond to pressure for very strict, preferably net zero greenhouse gas building codes. Hmm. Uh, Valerie, uh, you want to take that? I'm, uh, I, I don't have much to say. I know that the Department of State uh, mm -hmm. doesn't really have enforcement money. Uh, they have adopted the International Energy Conservation Code, but they do not have money for enforcement. Now, I did notice about a month ago that they put in place a new regulation which said that if a, if a code officer was not doing, was not representing the full code, that they could actually be removed. I saw that as a form of enforcement, but they don't have any money for enforcement. So most of the uh, code officers are doing what they usually do. Yeah, and I, I don't know much about it either. It's not my expertise, but I do know that it's a topic for conversation and it came up in the recent technical conferences on the white paper on efficiency. And there was a lot of discussion of the need for stretch codes and adoption of stretch codes um, and also for training and code, for, for um, code enforcement. So I think they're aware of it. And I do think that's something that's gonna be looked at and hopefully funded as we, as we move forward. Uh, code changes do require legislation, my understanding. So that would be a, a legislative package to look for next session. I, I've been involved with uh, training code officials for the last two years under a NYSERDA program. And uh, yeah, there's not a lot of action there. Mm -hmm. um, code officials kind of all do it the way their dads taught them. Yep. Well, maybe it's time for a new generation. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thanks again so much for joining tonight. Uh, thank you to our speakers and wonderful participants. We've had a lot of great questions and uh, it's been a really informative evening. I will send out a follow-up email with the PowerPoint pre presentations, some sample comments, ways to continue to be involved in this important movement to accelerate energy efficiency, which is so vital. Uh, to achieve our climate and clean energy goals here in New York. So uh, thank you for that. And also uh, stay tuned for upcoming online teach-ins about other topics. I know folks who submitted the registration form checked off other issues that they might be interested in learning about. New Yorkers for Clean Power uh, prioritizes, in addition to energy efficiency, renewable energy, electric vehicles. Uh, so we definitely have a lot of other issues that we can be talking about. We talked about some of them tonight uh, with heat pumps and microgrids and, uh, yes, more to come. So thanks again to everybody. Um, I can take everyone off uh, mute for a second so we can all hear each other and say hello and good night and uh, continue to work for a renewable energy efficient future here in New York State. So say hi everybody. Right. <laughs> hi and bye. Thanks good so much. Thank you. Thank you, Betta. Thank you. Thanks, Betta. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So bright. I'm not sure if we